Hey everyone, we're in Austin, Texas, covering the AMD Ryzen 7000 series CPU announcements, where AMD has now officially announced four CPUs. It's given us the price points, the release dates, and technically, it also showed a GPU in the RDNA 3 family, but nobody clapped for it very awkwardly, at least until after the AMD employees started clapping, and then they clapped for it. Anyway, we're going to be talking about all of that today and going over some of the existing Zen 4 information plus the new stuff. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode. We've used Linode for our own hosting for about a decade now, and we've loved working with them. With Linode, you can build your own VPN that you fully control. You can build a Pi-hole DNS sync hole to improve your network performance, or you can use other tools like Owncast to self-host your own independent streaming platform away from major providers. You can get a $100 credit when you use our link in the description below. We're going to have a lot more videos from this trip as well, including another video on this thing and some with Gordon. But to start with the CPUs, the specs, and everything else, uh, we're going to get straight to it. AMD renoted several previously disclosed pieces of information, like Zen 4, including PCIe Gen 5, DDR5, talking about the chipsets, but we know all that stuff. We'll recap that at the end. For the new information, there are four CPUs. There's the Ryzen 9 7950X. There is the Ryzen 9 7900X the Ryzen 7 7700X, and the Ryzen 5 7600X. So that's the CPU lineup. Pricing has them starting at $300 up to about $700. We'll obviously review them in full detail, have all the benchmarks for you as soon as we can so that you can make an informed decision from independent data from us as to whether the value is any good on those prices. But AMD did provide a couple of slides. We're not really going to show many of them for its first party data. Just we have a general rule of not showing a lot of first party slides because they are clearly biased. So uh, for pricing, that puts the 7600X at the lowest end, that's the 300 mark. The $400 mark is the 7700X, pretty similar to what we've seen in the last generation. And then the 7900X is 550, 7950X is $700. I think the original 50X SKU was 750, so that's come down a little bit. So that puts the 7600X as higher than the 1600, the 2600 series, where they were about $200 originally up to 250. So it's gone up, but it's the same as the 5600X from the most recent generation. And that was a point that a lot of people were upset about. Of course, when the 5600X launched, uh, I'm sure that AMD is hoping that at this point people have gotten over it because they've stuck to that price point. AMD also showed the slide of the, the top of a Radeon GPU with three red fins. It looks kind of like a render, but and then they were kind of like, here it, it is, a new GPU. And that was it. So uh, it's RDNA 3. The most interesting aspect of it is that it's running five nanometer chiplets. And unfortunately, absolutely zero additional information was given regarding that chiplet approach, because that's the part that would have actually gotten the room really excited about it and interested in it, because it's all monolithic for AMD's GPUs right now. So that's a big change and it's something interesting. And the last note that AMD made on this before moving on was that it is 50% uh, more performance per watt than the company's current GPUs. So that's all we got on that. Now, uh, CPU specs. This is where we get into the harder details of the four options that AMD announced today. So these follow the nomenclature previously established by the Ryzen 5000 series. The 7950X is 16 cores, 32 threads. It claims in very, very tiny text uh, that looks like it was added last minute up to 5.7 gigahertz or 4.5 gigahertz base. AMD noted that this is an 800 megahertz increase versus its previously advertised up two numbers for the Ryzen 5000 series. And then the 7950X runs 80 megabytes of L2 and L3 cache, and it has a 170 watt TDP, which is higher than previously. The 7900X is a 12 core, 24 thread part at 4.7 gigahertz base and 5.6 gigahertz boost. It has a four megabyte reduction on the cache, so it's down to 76 megabytes, and it uses the same TDP at 170 watts. And this tracks with the previous trends overall in terms of the reductions versus the 7950X. Notably, the 7900X has a higher base clock than the 7950X, despite a lower boost clock. This creates some situations where feasibly, it, if not core bound and stuck on base, it could perform better or equivalent to the 7950X. The Ryzen 7 7700X drops by 200 megahertz from the 7900X on base and boost alike, and it cuts the cache nearly in half, down to 40 megabytes and 105 watt for the TDP. 
And that 105 watt TDP number aligns with the previous 5800X and other CPUs like that. This one is an eight core 16 thread part, so you can think of it like the 5800X replacement. And then finally, AMD announced its R5 7600X. That's a six core 12 thread follow up to the R5 5600X. It runs 4.7 gigahertz base to 5.3 gigahertz boost and a 105 TDP, which is up from 65 watts on the 5600X, and then it has 38 megabytes of cache. So the 7700X is looking to us to be similar to how we've perceived other CPUs like the 3700X or the 5800X in this price class, where it's something that might make sense more for someone who is more on the enthusiast or gaming side with some production inclinations, or if the price drops over time, where the 5800X became much more interesting after that price drop. But initially, we sort of said, hey, the 5600X for gaming or the 59 or 5950 for high-end production type use, and then the middle was just uh, dead territory, basically, with the 5800X. And that obviously proved to work out because the price dropped about 100 bucks on the 5800X, and it made a lot more sense. We think the 7700X will probably end up getting the same type of review, but we'll see how the numbers look when we benchmark it. Now, next section, we're talking about AMD's coolers, so stock coolers and TDP, where you've definitely, as we've been talking about, heard that the TDP is now higher than it used to be. AMD's TDP formula is a little weird. So TDP is not is thermal design power. It is not exactly one-to-one -one with watts, but depending on the architecture and the situation, it tends to be pretty close. Uh, AMD calculates TDP as TDP in watts equals uh, T case, so that's the case temperature of the CPU, subtracting T ambient or the ambient temperature in degrees Celsius divided by theta CA, which is the thermal resistance of the cooler that's sitting on top of the CPU. And obviously that's a giant variable. So in other words, AMD can change the TDP numbers if it changes the thermal resistance of the heat sink. It doesn't have power in the formula other than at the very end with an equals after it. So we've covered that in previous videos if you wanna learn more about it. But it's suffice to say that basically these TDP numbers are higher than previously. Also, however, we need to actually test the power consumption in real use in different applications to see how it comes out in real life. Definitely related to this, AMD spent a significant portion of its presentation talking about performance per watt efficiency and talking about big increases in what it can do with the power that it's drawing. This is of course a good thing, but it serves as a bit of a counter or a negation to the slides showing a potentially higher power consumption in general. And that's probably why they made such a big deal about the efficiency increases. NVIDIA does the same thing where it increases the power consumption of a GPU, but it talks also about how the efficiency, what can be done with per unit of power uh, to kind of negate that. For cooling though, higher power consumption means that there's going to be a higher heat load and that it's going to be more difficult to cool the CPUs. AMD previously already announced that AM4 coolers will continue to work with AM5, which is what we're on now for 7000 series CPUs. And so that means that with an adapter kit, new mounting kit, you can move a cooler forward. However, if the power consumption is higher, you might need a more powerful cooler and the stock coolers will not be included with the Ryzen 7000 series. So Andy's gotten rid of them for these four CPUs. That doesn't mean that the Wraith or the Prism Aspire are gone. It just means that they're not shipping with these. It's possible that they come back with lower end stuff in the future. AMD hasn't announced any low end CPUs today. It took them quite a while, maybe a year or more, to really get into lower end stuff with the 5000 series. So for now, you're gonna be buying your own cooler or bringing one forward for Ryzen 7000. AMD also made big claims about having, quote, the fastest core for gamers and the most compute for creators. So we won't go through AMD's full numbers in detail here, uh, for reasons we already talked about, it's best you just come back to us and others for third-party benchmarks, but uh, we'll still go through some of them for the initial overview. So first of all, here's the fast recap. AMD noted a 13% IPC uplift in desktop performance versus the Ryzen 5000 series, and that'd be from architectural changes and not just frequency changes. AMD also stated a 29% uplift versus Ryzen 5000 CPUs and like-for-like -like comparisons in single-threaded performance. AMD also noted that its IPC uplift primarily comes from the L2 cache feeding the execution engine faster, and it provided a pretty useful image for kind of visualizing it. In this image, as AMD noted, it also benefits from significant improvements in branch prediction, a load store improvement, and a front end redesign. And the company said that most of the improvement is coming from that front end and from branch prediction specifically for the reworks in this architecture. 
On average, AMD claimed a 15% uplift in performance overall in the 7950X versus the 5950X, ranging 6% to 35% when testing gaming. It also noted a 30 to 48% uplift in production workloads like Blender, which specifically saw a 30% improvement from the 5950X to the 7950X. And as a reminder, we test Blender in our CPU suite, so we'll be able to look at that number specifically when we actually get the CPUs in hand and we can look at them. AMD also had a lot to say about Intel in this one. They were mostly talking about the 12900K. It was extremely direct. It's not like what Intel used to do when it was in the lead, and it would just say the competition. Everybody in the room knowing who the competition was. So AMD here really was straightforward with it, where they were showing a minus 1% to a 23% advantage versus the 12900K when looking at uh, a 7950X. And it also saw an advantage with a 7600X versus the 12900K. So AMD, at least by its own numbers, is looking competitive in gaming against Intel's most recent high-end Alder Lake. Now, whether that comes to fruition will depend, obviously, on how the games are tested what variables were controlled, and that's what we specialize in. So we'll look at those numbers and we'll give you an unfiltered view of it as soon as we have the CPUs as noted earlier. Just as one quick example, AMD pointed out an 11% higher performance in the 7600K versus the 12900K in F1 2022. And uh, it also, again, reiterated what it called a 47% higher energy efficiency, uh, its words, than the 12900K in the 7950X, which sort of falls back in line with this general undertone of our efficiency is higher, look away from the big TDP number. It also felt like AMD was taking shots at Intel throughout the, actually, yeah, throughout the presentation, uh, not just for CPUs, maybe for GPUs as well, because it made a specific comment about RDNA 3 being on track and that they're gonna hit their previously mentioned window for when they're releasing the new GPUs and kind of the implied there is Intel can't even hit the window of three years ago when it talked about GPUs, but AMD says it's going to. So not really any useful information there, just some sort of industry back and forth as they fight it out. But just briefly, AMD also mentioned Expo. To get everyone on the same page, Expo or EXPO is, it's basically version of XMP. Technically, XMP is an Intel technology, uh, extreme memory profile, extreme starts with an X, and the XMP options that are out there, all they do is store all the timings basically to a spot on the stick that the motherboard can then read and apply so that you get the higher performing timings on your memory rather than the JEDEC timings. The JEDEC is the sort of industry standard. This is the baseline performance level and XMP goes up. And so technically AMD and Intel like consider this to be overclocking even though it's basically advertised as a stock specification of the RAM. Everyone I think is up to speed on this, but Expo is AMD's version of XMP where previously you rely on motherboard vendors to introduce something like DOCP uh, or any of the number of other ones that are basically just doing a good estimate of XMP on AMD. So uh, Expo is supposed to give some better timing dialing and this is something we've already known about a little while. Motherboard vendors actually already have it in some of the beta BIOSes. Um, but they kept getting pushed back. Up next, socket and core size. AMD also reminded everyone of several things that they've already said, but it's worth recapping this one just because the news has been spread out over the last year or so. First off, it is an LGA socket. This is specifically an LGA 1718 socket. That means 1,718 pins. It is not PGA or pin grid array. It's land grid array, and that's what Intel uses. So th this isn't news. It's just we want to make sure everyone is caught up if you haven't checked in in a while. The socket was noted as having support through 2025 with a plus at the end. They didn't nail it down, so it could just be 2025 plus till December of 2025. Uh, but that's, that's a pretty decent socket service life of three or so years, plus a little bit maybe, two to three years. And the cores were noted as 3.84 millimeters squared very tiny for the cores. That is not the total die size of the chiplet size, that's the core size. And the reason AMD brought this up is because as compared to existing Alder Lake CPUs, the die area is significantly lower for what AMD is shipping where uh, core to core, it's 3.84 millimeters squared versus 7.46 millimeters squared on Alder Lake. And they also gave an image of the Alder Lake versus the Zen 4 core sizes, 
And uh, again, not total die size for those numbers, but they're saying, look, this one's smaller, and uh, so it's more space efficient and more energy efficient is the angle that they're taking. And then finally, this is all the stuff we already knew, but just recapping it. So again, AM4 CPU coolers are compatible with AM5. Obviously, there is zero compatibility between the old CPUs and the new ones. That should be very clear. They move into LGA, it's a totally different socket. For uh, the cooler compatibility, it should be roughly the same socketed Z height, but the cooler companies will have to make or ship some brackets to adapt you forward if you want to carry one forward. We also already knew that AMD was planning 3D vCache or Zen 4 in the future, probably next year. It's also planning Zen 5. I had that on the roadmap officially. It's been announced. They talk about Zen 5C, and they also talked about Zen 5 3D vCache. So all of that is officially in the plans, but it's quite a ways out. Uh, Zen 4 CPUs will only be DDR5. They will have PCIe Gen 5 capability on the CPU um, as a reminder. The CPU has a number of PCIe lanes that it splits off to the GPU, like PEG or the first GPU slot, and then some to the chipset where the chipset does the rest and handles things like 10 gigabit ethernet or other ancillary PCIe devices, uh, SATA, things of that nature. A Gen 5 can be divvied up or, or changed what gets that Gen 5 support depending on the motherboard vendor when they're specking out the board. So AMD's already told us all, that the extreme version of the X670 chipset or the B650 chipsets with the E at the end, that's the one where you're guaranteed certain PCIe designations with lanes going to graphics for PCIe Gen 5 and to an SSD for PCIe Gen 5. Without the E, it's up to the motherboard manufacturers entirely. There's no guarantee you get those two. So you'll need to sort of check board to board. And uh, that's the only difference between X670 and X670E is just the guarantee, but the actual lane count remains the same between them. The B650 stuff is the same thing. B650 and B650E, it's just a change of what goes where. So it's a badge, basically, that E. It doesn't actually change the specification. Last point here is just our thoughts on this. So you come to our news recap to get our take on it. And I think one of the biggest concerns is going to be that 7600X price point, not necessarily because of the CPU price, which was already up from previously, but because of two new factors. One is now Intel does have Alder Lake on the market. Core to core is basically irrelevant. I see a lot of people always talk about like, well, but it's X hundred dollars for six cores on the other one. Doesn't matter. What matters is the performance and AMD sees IPC uplift. They see other improvements. So they might be competitive with Alder Lake. We don't know how the 13,000 series will shake up. What matters though, for sure, is that 7600X $300 CPU the bottom price for motherboards that AMD announced during its presentation is $125. So their whole thing was AM5 boards start from $125. And we all know what a $125 motherboard looks like these days. It's not that pretty. It cuts a lot of features. So you're now going to have a $300 CPU, let's say $150 motherboard, and DDR5, which is still very expensive. It's coming down, but it's, it, it's not DDR4 prices yet. So without having that sort of crutch to lean on that Intel has had with Alder Lake, where it is DDR4 and 5 compatible, AMD is going forward with the most expensive technology only, where you need a new motherboard. Not a big deal because you need a new motherboard a lot of the times, like with Intel, but the prices are higher than they've been in the past, and DDR5 price is high. So we think the 7600X, although it looks competitive and AMD's uh, slideshow is putting it in a good light right now versus the 12900K, we think its weak point might be the total package pricing, but don't want to speculate on it too much because obviously we don't have it yet to benchmark, so we'll let you know soon. Uh, the rest of the pricing is in line with previous pricing. If AMD's numbers are to believe, be believed they're ahead of Intel, uh, it's just going to come down to what does Intel do with the 13 series, and normally these companies try to launch depending on if they think they have an advantage or not before the other one. So. We'll look into all of that in the near future. So finally here, the B650 boards, both types, are shipping in October, and the X670 boards are shipping in September alongside the September 27th release of the CPUs. Uh, and then PCIe Gen 5 drives, AMD says, which doesn't, doesn't own that stuff, but says we'll begin shipping in November if you're trying to spec out a build and get it going for end of year. So we'll be reviewing all this stuff as it comes out. We have a lot more to talk about uh, as, you can see here, probably, 
So we'll be going over that in a separate video. Make sure you subscribe. And as we sort of parse through the rest of the presentation and all of Andy's notes on site, we'll have updates for you. But this was our on the ground show coverage. And thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly. Where currently we are giving 10% of our store revenue to the charity Cat Angels that we detailed in the last Harbor News uh, episode up through September 17th. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.